to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Apostle Paul so wonderfully says, For when we were still without strength, in due time, or at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans chapter 5, verse number 6. We welcome you to our second lesson in our series on the book of Romans. The message of the book of Romans is such a powerful and wonderfully needed message. The gospel is God's power to save all men. Romans 1 verse 16. And in this series we're thinking about in chapters 5 through 8 that necessity being unfolded. The power of the gospel being unfolded in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As always we want to encourage you to have your Bible handy as we're going to be looking to the Word of God for our message of salvation today. Friend, we want you to know that the churches of Christ in your area are bringing these messages to you today. We hope that you'll stop by and visit the Church of Christ in your area. Their worship on Sunday morning or Sunday evening or Bible study on Wednesday, they'd be happy to have you join their assembly. And any type of question about God or the Bible, or if you'd like to sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one Bible study, they'd be more than happy to help you with that in any way. And friend, we also want you to know that with this evangelistic work, the Gospel of Christ, all our material is provided to you free of charge. You can access it through our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We've got DVD studies, video studies, audio studies, as well as written material, just a, a good variety of Bible study material on nearly any topic that you can imagine. And it's all available to you free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of any of our lessons, you can go to our website, fill out our free media request form, and we'd be more than happy to send that to you to aid you in your study of God's divine Word. After just concluding the thoughts of Romans chapter 1 through 4, the Gentiles are under sin, chapter 1. The Jews are condemned under sin as well because of their hypocrisy in chapter 2. And kind of to summarize it all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and men and women can be made right through faith in Jesus Christ. Now in chapter 5, Paul the writer, God is going to illustrate the blessings of that faith, that obedient trust, Romans 1.5, Romans 16.22, that is found in Jesus Christ. What are some of those blessings? Well, friend, through faith we have access to God's great love and salvation for mankind. I want you to look at some of the most beautiful language in all of Scripture with me in Romans 5 verses 6 through 10. You'll be hard-pressed to find more beautiful moving language than this. Look at these words. Romans 5 look in verses 6 through 10. The Bible says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Friend, there are so many wonderful things that are illustrated in this text. You have the, the love of God that is put on a, a, a supreme pedestal, as it were here. At the right time, God expressed that love to each and every one of us when we were in such a deplorable state. And he kind of illustrates that idea of not only God's supreme love, but man's supreme need for that love. Think about where man was 
when Christ came into the world, in that relationship with God. It came at the right time. We were ungodly. That's one of the words that is used. We were enemies. That's another word that is used. Romans 5, verse 10, we were separated from God. You know, and it kind of illustrates it this way. For a righteous man, some might dare die. For a good man, yes, yeah, some might give up their life. But for ungodly, immoral sinners and enemies, would anybody give up their life? No, most likely not. That is exactly what God did for me and you. We were ungodly. We were separated from God. I'm talking about man in sin. Okay, in a state of sin and lost. Living for himself, not living for God. All of us have been lost in sin at one time. I was an enemy of God. I had turned my back on God and His law. I had become separated from God. I, I, I needed God's love desperately. And friend, that's the point when God reached out the most to save man. That doesn't illustrate the beautiful love of God. Friend, I just don't know what will. 2 Corinthians 8 9 is kind of a, what I think of as a complimentary verse to this section. Paul says this in that letter, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. Look at what God did, what God gave up when man was at his ugliest, at his lowest. God sent His Son to save him. And then in Romans chapter 5, the writer not only illustrates the love of God and man's need for it, but he kind of looks back to the beginning and contrasts the first Adam with the last Adam. The, uh, the Adam and Christ is kind of contrasted, and there's some real parallels here that are very important. Look in Romans 5, verses 14 following. The Word of God says in verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense or sin. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift, which came from or because of many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Now, I know that's a, a mouthful of what Paul said there, but friend, they're just really some basic ideas that help us understand the blessings of faith in Jesus Christ. Paul takes us all the way back to Adam. And Romans 5 verse 12 says, Through one man sin entered into the world, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. He teaches us that with Adam's one sin, with him and Eve eating that forbidden fruit, uh, uh, sinning against God, they opened the door for sin, and that one action opened that door, and each one of us, because of our own sin, Romans 5 verse 12, have walked through that door. But then he contrasts that the first man, Adam, with Jesus, a type of the new Adam, who's going to make things right. And Jesus' action of living a perfect life and making himself a sacrifice has opened another door. Not the door of sin that everybody has walked through, but it's as though another door has been opened, and that door is the door of salvation. And every person who puts faith in Jesus Christ can walk through that door and be saved with Christ. And so the great contrast here between Adam and Christ is such a... Uh, a day and night, dark and light type of difference. One man's action, sin's door was opened and everybody walked through it because of their own choice. Another man, Christ, his action opened the door, flung open wide the door of salvation. And friend, the message of Romans is, if you'll put your faith in Him and you'll trust in Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the type of Adam, He can save you as that one man's action opened the door for sin. The second man's action opened the door for salvation. And anybody who will put their trust in Jesus can be saved from that. Then we direct our attention to Romans chapter 6 where Paul teaches 
these Jewish Christians, some of them, who have been dead to the old law, dead in the old law, some of them, he teaches them that now through Christ you can be dead to sin and alive to God. You no longer have to be dead in sin, you can be dead to sin and alive in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 Paul clearly says when you die to sin you can't go back and live habitually practice that anymore. A death to sin must be complete. Romans 6 verses 1 and 2 Paul says these words. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Part of the discussion is that, that God gave His grace to deal with the sin problem. And because there was a, a multiplicity of sin, God uh, gave a, a multiplicity of grace, an abundance of grace to save man from their sin. And so in somebody's mind, they might be thinking, more sin, more grace. Hmm. The more I sin, the more grace I'll receive. And Paul says, wait, 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 wait. That's not what we're talking about. You don't keep sinning to get more grace. That was a one-time offering to deal with the sin problem, but it's not something you just keep getting all the time the more you sin. And so when he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You don't keep living in sin to get God's grace. That's the opposite of what we need to do. And thus he says in verse 2, We who have died to sin should live no longer in it. When I obey the gospel and I become a Christian, and I resolve to do my best to live a life that's dead to sin, friend, I don't resurrect that old life anymore. And I'm not saying from time to time that we don't sin and that we don't slip or that we don't make mistakes. But friend, we're trying to walk in the light. 1 John 1 verse 7. We're trying to be cognizant of any sin and repent of that. 1 John 1 verses 8 through 10. And we don't go back and live that type of life anymore. If I become dead to sin, I need to bury it, do my best to let it lie, and not resurrect that life. I can't be faithful to God if I live in sin again. Luke 9 verse 62 says it this way, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. When I put my hand to the plow, uh, figurative idea of reaching afford to the things which are ahead, living for Christ every day, I don't look back to the old life anymore. I look ahead to living for God and trying to serve Him. Then in Romans chapter 6, he ties all of this idea about being dead to sin into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The question being then, when does a person become dead to sin? If I can know when I'm dead to sin, I can know when I'm right with God, right? Well, look at the answer in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. The scripture says this, backing up to verse 2, Certainly not, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or when do we die for sin? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When do we die to sin? Well, friend, what is it? that kills sin? What is it, to put another way, what is it that removes sin in our life? Friend, I think we realize as we study the New Testament that it's the blood and the death and the sacrifice of Jesus that removes sin, right? Do you remember Matthew 26, verse number 28? Jesus, as He is about to institute the Lord's Supper at the Feast of the Passover, Jesus takes that fruit of the vine and He says these words in Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many, watch this now, for the remission of sins. What removes sin? The blood and the death and the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, keep that on the forefront of your mind and notice what Paul says in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. He again says these words, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into His death, we were buried with Him. Therefore, Paul's point is you don't ever come out of that to live in sin again. When do we contact? Now, friend, this is so important. I don't want you to miss this. When does an individual contact the death and the blood and the salvation that Jesus offers? If His blood saves us from sin, if His death 
saves us from sin. Acts 20 verse 28, if He died for all men and His death defeated Satan and sin, when do I contact that death? Friend, whenever that is, that's when I'm saved, right? Well, let's use an example from Saul of Tarsus. Great servant of God went, to be, went on to be the great Apostle Paul. Saul is told in Acts 9 verses 1 through 6 directly by Jesus, Saul, I want you to go in the city. You'll be told you what you must do. Lord, what would you have me do? Won't you go in the city? It'll be told you what you must do. Paul recounts his own conversion. And in Acts 22, 16, he has this recounting. And an ass comes to him. And he says, Saul, Saul, why tarriest thou? Or why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Why are sins washed away at the point of baptism? Because of what Romans 6, 3 and 4 teaches. Listen carefully now. Don't miss this point. The Bible teaches when I am baptized, I contact the saving death and blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Is that what Romans 6, 3 and 4 says? Look at it again with me now. The Bible says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, notice, were baptized into His death. Therefore were buried with Him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Friend, if when I'm baptized I contact the death of Christ and the death and the blood and the sacrifice of Christ saves, there's no salvation outside of contacting that by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now friend, hear me well. We're not saying that there's something mystical or magical about it. We're not saying that it alone saves, that baptism alone saves. You've got to, you know, hear the Word of God. You no doubt have to believe in Jesus. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. A person has to confess the Savior as the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 10. You've got to be willing to repent of sin in your life. Jesus clearly taught that in Luke 13, 3. But friend, don't ignore the fact that the Bible teaches, the book of Romans teaches, you contact the death of Jesus when you're buried with Him at the point of baptism. Now in Romans chapter 6, we also learn the importance of obedience to God. This is simply like believing, like hearing, like repenting of sin. Being baptized is simply a matter of doing what God says, right? And God tells us to be saved, we must obey Him. Romans 6, 17 puts it this way. Notice in your Bible these words. Paul says, God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. We used to be in sin, but when we obeyed God, we were freed from sin and no longer slaves to that. And friend, thank God that we're not. Because the Bible clearly teaches in Romans 6, verse 23, you don't want to be in a relationship with sin when you leave this world. Sin has too high of a debt that you cannot pay. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Now contrast that, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I can escape the debt, escape the slavery, and escape the consequences of it by being buried into Christ's death through baptism, or if I choose to live my way, live according to sin, when the payday comes, when the bill is due, I'll assure you, you do not want to have to pay the consequences of sin. The wages, the paycheck, the salary, the, the recompense of sin is death. And friend, we're not talking about physical death. We're talking about spiritual death. If men and women live in sin, and die in sin without Jesus Christ, they will suffer eternal separation from Almighty God in the fires of hell. Nobody wants that. God doesn't want that. We don't want that. In your right, if you're thinking in your right mind, you don't want that. But friend, realize, without the gospel of Christ and without a saving type of faith, obedient trust in God, there is no possibility of salvation. Then in chapter 7, Paul goes on to show some of these Jewish writers or Jewish readers that um, under the law, it's different. It was different under the law, but that law is dead now. And you're in, you have a, some of them may be feeling guilty 
like being in a marriage relationship where at one time they were married to one person. When that person died, they had freedom to remarry. And there may be that guilt involved in that. And so Paul shows that you, since Christ has come, you are dead to the law and you can freely marry another person without any guilt or consequences. And so he shows in Romans 7, verses 1 through 4, this idea from the marriage perspective. Notice Romans 7, beginning in verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. You're under the law as long as you live. For the woman, and he likens it to marriage, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she's married another. Now here's the point of it all, okay? Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. And so, in essence, he's saying to, to, to you Jews who have rightfully been under the law, that law's dead. And you do not have to feel like you're an adulterer or guilty being married to Christ. And he says, let me illustrate it for you this way. Let's say there's a man and a woman and they're married. Now, if both of them are alive, and the man or the woman decides, I want to go find another mate and marry somebody else. She'll be an adulterer or he'll be an adulterer, rightfully so. There's a lot of guilt and a lot of sin involved in that. But if those two people are rightfully married to each other and one of them dies, well, this mate that's still alive is free to marry somebody else without any guilt or consequences. And so what he's saying is about Christ and the old law. The, you were married to the old law. The old law has been completed Christ is the fulfillment of it. It's dead. You don't have to worry about guilt or, or spiritual adultery in that. Now, you can be freely married to Christ who was the completion of this old law. And, and while his teaching is about being married to Christ and the freedom to do that, friend, we also understand the importance of marriage being illustrated in this idea. But more than anything, I want you to clearly see from this, this is probably one of the single greatest te texts to show that the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, and the Law of Moses is not a viable law that's alive today. You couldn't break or keep the old law today because it's dead. Paul clearly said that. Now, when he says in Romans 7 verse 4 that it's dead, what law is he talking about here? Well, let's be clear. Look in Romans 7, verse 7. I want you to see clearly what law Paul is saying is dead. Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would have not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. What law said, Thou shalt not covet? Well, friend, that is clearly taken from Exodus chapter 20. And so when we think about this idea, let's realize the law that we are dead to, that we cannot be accused of committing spiritual adultery against if we're a Christian, is the same Ten Commandment law that said, Thou shalt not covet. Friend, that clearly expresses that the old law is not for many women today. Friend, we're not saying that there aren't truths in that old law. We're not saying that that old law doesn't have lessons about God or life or things in it that are true about God. It does. But on the day of judgment, that's not what I'll be judged by, nor what anybody today will be judged by. John 12, 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him. Then very briefly in Romans chapter 8, Paul mentions that if you are in Christ, continuing this idea, if you're in Christ, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. I don't stand condemned if I'm in the law of Christ and living according to teaching of Christ. Rather, we have the hope and the beauty to look forward to of heaven. No matter what happens, heaven will be worth it all. Paul says in Romans 8, 18, I consider the sufferings of this present world, they're not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so we've got no condemnation. We have the promise of heaven in Christ. We have God's providential care. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Romans 8 verse 28. And friend, if God is for us, 
Who can be against us? Romans 8, verse 37, Neither height nor depth nor any other thing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friend, we lovingly ask you today to consider where you are. Are you in Christ? If not, are you in sin? Friend, remember, the wages of sin is death. You cannot pay that debt. You do not want to reap the consequences of being spiritually lost. If you're not in Christ, friend, we are pleading with you with your soul in jeopardy to become a child of God. Know this, God loves you so much, He sent His only begotten Son. Remember Romans 5 verse 6, when we were still without strength, when we couldn't help ourselves, at the right time God sent forth His Son to die for sinners. That's me and that's you. How wonderful a message of salvation that is. The gospel, it's God's power. It's the only way you can be saved today and you can have the ability to know that you're right with God, know you're living by faith in the Word of God, and know that on that final day, you'll have heaven as a home. If you've not obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to today. Believe in Jesus as God's Son. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. Having believed Him to be the Son of God, Acknowledge that with your mouth. Romans 10 verse 10. With the heart one believes in the righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Repent. Turn from things in your life that are not right. Die to those. Romans 6 verse 1. And then as Paul said in Romans 6 verses 3 and 4, be buried with Christ in baptism where we access the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friend, this is such a wonderful message that men and women today can be saved from sin, that the gospel is God's power to save, and that we can have hope and have a life worth living through Jesus Christ. If that's not yours, friend, won't you become a Christian today? Don't you want that hope? Don't you want to live a life that has real meaning and purpose? Jesus can provide that. And our prayer is that you'll obey the gospel and be saved before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.